everyone. So glad that you are all in the house of the Lord today. How many has come to worship the Lord today? Oh, we're going to try that again. How many has come to worship the Lord today? Amen. How many realizes that the sun is shining outside? It's a beautiful day outside. Everything is great and wonderful. You know, it's amazing how that if we're not careful, we can let a few uh, rain showers determine our worship today, right? Because some determined their presence in the house of the Lord today because it was raining, right? But you come today, and I'm glad you're here. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, now, listen. Some of you don't do this when I ask you to, so I'm going to be watching to make sure you do. I want you to step out of your pews, and I want you to go find somebody that you normally don't shake their hand. Come on, I want you to start moving right now. Start moving, shaking people's hands. Come on, you that are in the back back there, step out of the pews. Come on. That's right. good day. This is a great day. Come on, this is a day that the Lord has made. What a wonderful, wonderful opportunity that we have today to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Of course, today is our mission Sunday and uh, Brother Daryl is going to come and just share a very few words and then he's going to pray over our missionaries, uh, and we want to just uh, reach out to the Lord right now, call upon our missionaries, because you see, we have men and women who were, a, were felt the call to leave the comforts of the United States and to go and spread this beautiful gospel that we love so dear. And so Brother Daryl's going to come and just share a few words. Good morning to everybody. Today is a blessed day. Uh, you have a great opportunity today to uh, to bless our missionaries. This is we're right here at the last week of uh, of 2019, and out on the table today I have uh, two uh, papers uh, discussing uh, the two of our missionaries, uh, one from Guyana and one from uh, New Caledonia. Stop by the table and pick up uh, one of these papers. Um, these missionaries ha have gone and and uh, they are spreading the uh, word of God all over the. Uh, United States. So, uh, our missionaries are important to us, and as we as we close out this year, uh, let, let's uh, let's bless our missionaries today. I know we've gone through Christmas and we're getting ready to go through New Year's, but let's not forget our missionaries here at the end of the at the end of the year. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for them. Lord, we come to you today, thanking you for the opportunity to to bless our missionaries. Lord, they have gone out of this United States to to uh, spread this gospel unto you, Lord. As Ask you, Lord, to bless our missionaries, Lord. Bless them financially, Lord. Bless them as they, they in their ministry, Lord. Be with them, Jesus. We praise you, Lord, to lift you up today. Thanking you for our opportunity to bless our missionaries in Jesus' name. The same. I would strongly encourage you that after service today in the foyer, there is a table that is our missionary table. And on that table, there are the forms of the two missionaries uh, that we have selected this month to just have focused prayer over. And so I would love for you to go by, grab those forms, put them on your refrigerator for this month, uh, and just spend time praying over them, calling upon the name of Jesus for their families, uh, because they are certainly in the battle for souls, and we want to pray for them like never before. How many has come to give the Lord an offering today? How many has come to bring Him your tithes and offerings? Uh, would you reach in and grab your offering right now? And, and would you grab your tithes and let's raise that to the heavens right now? And let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, uh, for this great opportunity. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that we have this way means uh, of being able to give unto you our tithes uh, and our offerings this morning. Uh, thank you, God, for giving us jobs. Uh, 
Thank you for giving us abilities, uh, talents uh, to be able to do the work that we do, uh, to earn an income for our family. Uh, but now, God, we want to give back to you uh, what belongs to you. Uh, and God, we're asking that you would bless it right now. Uh, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Uh, amen, amen. Uh, why don't you come out the right side? Come back in the left. Uh, let's bring our tithes and offerings uh, unto the Lord. Would you just worship and lift up this song as you come to get? The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? I will wait on you. Oh, I will wait on you, you Lord. I will trust in you. For all of my days I will trust in you. Let your voice say the Lord.
Yes, I will see the goodness of the Lord. Lift your voice and say, I will remain confident in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. One more time, lift your voice. I will remain confident in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. Oh, I will wait on you. Oh, I will wait.
this moment. Would you just all lift up hands? God, we can walk into any battle in any situation unafraid because we know the end of the book. We know no battle that you face. You will ever lose. You're our victor. You're our champion.
just remind in that situation, wait, who are you? Who do you think you are? You have to bow. So right now, I know there are some people, can I get a witness here today, that there are some situations that need to be reminded of who your God is. Come on, anybody in this place today? We're going to sing this part again and say, who are you, great mountain, that you should not bow low to the king? I got to do what I feel in the Holy Ghost right now. I feel like there are some of you that are facing some serious mountains right now. This is the last Sunday of 2019. And we're getting ready to go into 2020. And some of us need to make up in our mind right now, I'm giving this mountain to the Lord. I don't know who you are. And I don't know what your mountain is, so I'm not asking you to speak your mountain now, right now. But I'm going to ask you to move out of your pews right now. If you're here today and you need God to do a miracle in your life, you need God to heal, you need God to set free, you need God to pull down a barrier, a wall. Maybe you've just been fighting some things in 2019 that you are so tired of fighting. And you're saying, today I'm giving this mountain to God. Today I'm surrendering this to the Lord. I'm not walking into 2020 with this on my back. I'm not walking into this new year feeling this way with this mindset, with this thinking. I got to be really careful because I could bust out in my message that I'm going to preach next week because I haven't preached in about eight or nine weeks. But I'm going to tell you something. It's time that we get a mind change around here. And it's time we look at that mountain and say, Mountain, you can't control me. Mountain, you can't rule me. Mountain, you don't have the authority over me. I don't know who you are, but I want you right now, I want you to gather in as close as you can. Come on, because there's power in this place. There's power in this house. And I want you right now, I want you to raise those hands to the heaven. Come on, Mike. Come on, Jody. Come on. All over this place right now. Come on, I want you to surrender.
takes us. You need to realize who you really are. And I believe that when you realize who you really are, the kingdom will be won a lot easier. You are the image of God. Jesus made this very clear in both Luke and uh, Matthew or Mark when he said that they came to him and they said, Do we, should we pay taxes? And he asked a question. He says, whose image is on this coin? And they said, Caesar's. And he said, well, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but give unto God what is God. He was not telling us just to pay our debts. He was not telling us how to, how to excel in a, in a secular society by paying taxes. He said, Caesar's image is on that coin. Give it back to him. But you're in my image. You belong to me. So what that scripture is telling us, do you realize, if I could peel back the layer of the supernatural right now and show you that there is a host of angels, because I can feel them in this room. What they do is they move forward and they say, make way for the image of God. Angels are here today moving past anxieties. They're moving past mountains and they're saying, bow down, the image of God walks among us. That is you. So what you can do right now is not with arrogance, but with assurance of being made in the image of a king. You can lift your hands and say, God, you made me in your image, and I am but just a little lower than the angels. So I speak right now. <laughs> Make way, not for me, but the image of who I portray. I give myself to the one whom I am made in the image of. And when you do that, mountains bow in the supernatural. So with every bit of Holy Ghost assurance you have in your spirit right now, I want you to lift those hands, and not with a boldness of your own mouth and a boldness of your own attitude, none of that. All of that dies right here. I want you to speak to the issue whose image you're in. Go ahead. Speak it out. Everything God ever made that was, He spoke. So everything that we want to bow and see it bow, we must speak. So all across this room right now, Anxiety, you must bow. Depression, you must bow. Problems, you must bow. For I am in the image of God and I bear His image. With that boldness, now worship the one who you are made in the likeness of. God,
somebody a message for them. This isn't about the preacher. This is about the people that the Lord is speaking through the preacher to. And I'm thankful to be that preacher today. Uh, if you can make your way back to your seats, I believe that the Lord has already begun a work in this place. I feel like he's planting seeds of mercy. He's planting seeds of his identity and some people. And I believe that the Lord is going to do something exponential in the lives of people this afternoon. Because that's what God loves to do, amen. I'm going to be reading from 1 John chapter 2. Uh, it'll be on the screens, but if you're a little old-fashioned and you like to turn to your Bible, that's perfectly fine and encouraged, amen. I'm so thankful to be here. Uh, Pastor Manning, I have, this year, my wife can attest to this, the more I read about anybody in the Bible, and the more I read the Bible, and the more I seek after God, I'm finding a very common thread that is woven through the entire book from Genesis to Revelations, that this thing is really pretty much just all about people. <laughs> and the common thread through the Gospels is, how much are we going to really love those people? And this, is a, this may not be a revelation for the type blues in the room, if you've ever done the, the colors test, if you don't know what I'm talking about. Go and look it up on Google. But I'm a type green. I'm more about knowledge than I am relationships. And this is a revelation for me. And I have fallen in love all over again with preaching uh, this year. I've been preaching for 14 years. And I've just fallen head over heels in love with it. Because this is really the only place where I know how to love a whole room at one time. Through preaching is the only way that I know that I can hug an entire congregation at one time. After the pulpit, I enjoy hugging individuals, but this is really the only place where you can do, you can just love on the whole room, and I've just fallen in love with preaching for that reason, and that's what I want to do today. I want to love on this entire room, not, not the love of Aaron, but the love of Christ that is in me for this room, because that's what God has given me. I want to give you an assurance today, and in three days, we're going to move forward into a new year, and all that tells me is that time keeps ticking forward. That doesn't mean people do. And we'll hit 2020 in three days. And that doesn't mean that you moved forward. That just means time is still going. And I think the hardest thing for us to cope with as finite beings is the fact that time marches on even though we aren't able to march on sometimes. This was one of the hard lessons my wife and I had to learn was that time just keeps going on unapologetically even though we want to stay where we are. And we feel like there's pieces of us that are left in the past. Time is vicious. 
But today what I want to help you to do at your own pace and God's timing in your individual lives, I want you to move forward today. And there's really only one way we can do that. We need to have a revelation of the blood of Jesus. So 1 John 2, I'm going to read from verse 1. I give honor to your pastor, Pastor Manning, Sister Angela. I love y'all. I'm so thankful for y'all. I really do love this church. Thankful to be here. Not that my opinion matters, but I turned to my wife and I said, this is a good church. <laughs> you know that already, though, don't you? <laughs> I hope you do. 1 John 2, verse 1, it says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But then he gives an addendum because he understands life. And he says, But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. The word advocate there is the Greek word for parakletos, which means one who defends in a court of law. That's its literal meaning. Listen who the advocate is. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Then it gives this long word that a lot of people don't really know, myself included, that we kind of glaze over. He is the propitiation for our sins. That is just a fancy word for appeasement because there is a wrath of God. But all of it was poured on two beams of wood and on one individual. He was what appeased the wrath of God. The literal Hebrew meaning for that word is mercy seat. So God Almighty sits on the man Jesus as a mercy seat. And he can only view you through Jesus. For our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is good news. <laughs> Anybody familiar with the word the gospel? It means good news in the Greek, the Greek word eongelion, which literally means there is a king now that is above every king, and he is going to abolish every law that has held us bound. That is the good news. So I want to talk to us about that today, and I want to use this title to keep us on track, The Trial That Changed History. Look at somebody right now and just say, I'm on trial. Now, if you lay your Bible aside, I want you to lift your hands, and I want you to focus all of your mind, all of your spirit, all of your flesh right now, I want you to focus it on the forgiveness and the love of God. That's what we're going to do right now. And I want you to speak to him right now and thank him for his blood. And hopefully before this service is over, we'll get a revelation of how powerful that blood is. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord God, that I came to you with nothing to offer. There's nothing I could give you to appease you. Not enough fasting, not enough prayer, not enough money could appease, Lord, my sins. But, Lord, you sent yourself robed in flesh, and you died for my sins, Lord, so I can roll everything back and I can approach you, a holy and a righteous God, all because of your blood. I thank you for that, Lord, for it's good news for a wretch like me. It's good news for a failure like me. And, Lord, I'm not going to be self-deprecating. I'm going to be confident in your blood. Lord, there's nothing good about me, but everything that is good is because of your blood. So I stand here with a boldness and with an assurity because of your blood and how powerful it is. In the name of Jesus, we identify with you today. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Now, undoubtedly, many of us in this room know how the court system works. Some of you may in your past have gone through the court system and may be more intimate with it than others. Some of you may know through reading, some of you through media, but we all have a pretty good idea of how the court system works. If a person is accused of a crime and there's enough evidence, then the offense goes to trial. We know that. And it's in this trial that there is a prosecutor or a prosecution attorney. His job is to gather enough evidence and to use his knowledge of the law to put away the offender for the allotted amount of time that is said by law. But also in this exact same courtroom, there is also a defense attorney. His job is to cross-examine witnesses and to gather equal amount of evidence and to appeal before a judge and a jury of peers so as to get the accused off of the crime. And it's in this room where a diplomatic battle ensues between these two knowledgeable individuals of a prosecutor and a defense attorney. But however, in this battle, they're not battling with swords or spears. They're not putting on boxing gloves and entering into a ring. They battle with their wits and their knowledge of the law. They are using the law to either prosecute or release the person that is on trial. And it's in this room where a judge or jury will listen to the defense and the prosecuting attorneys and they will gather all of the evidence and they will base a decision off of what the prosecutor 
and the defender brought before them. And we all know the traditional dropping of the gavel as the sentence is given based off of the evidence that is brought forward. It's in this room where people stand helplessly between a prosecutor and a defender. It's in this place where the person will often not say a word because they are not as knowledgeable of the law as the two people that are either prosecuting or defending. You sit there helplessly having faith in your defender. Amen? And often loathing your prosecutor. Because there's one thing on your mind as the criminal. I want freedom. And you will pay often in the world big money for good attorneys based off of their track record. And somebody who can get more people off of their offense that they committed, they will pay bigger money. And they become in higher demand because of their ability to get people out of trouble. When a good defense attorney does his job, The judge and jury will come to a conclusion, they will drop the gavel and they will say, we drop all charges for there is not enough evidence to convict this individual. And that person, whether they committed the crime or not, can walk as if nothing had ever happened. They then must get over their own conscience that they committed the crime, but as far as the law is concerned, they are free. And the judge and jury are the ones who ultimately make that decision. Some famous criminal defense lawyers include Jose Baez for the acquittal of Casey Anthony, who was accused of murder. Johnny Cochran for the acquittal of O.J. Simpson, who was accused of murder. Thomas Messereau for the acquittal of Robert Blake, who was accused of murder. These, along with many others, shook America. And they have gone down in history as as trials that have changed history. Because all of America knew these three individuals were guilty. Yet, because of a good defense lawyer, they were able to walk free. Now, whether they're free in their mind, whether they're still dealing with guilt, that's entirely up to them as an individual. But as far as the law is concerned, the law has said, go forth, do what you want to, go live in society, be free. All because of a good attorney. Today, the trial of the century of the millennium, of the eon, is going on right now. And every single one of us sits right here helplessly between a prosecutor and a good defense lawyer. Just in case you think you're squeaky clean and everything is perfect in your life, you're a good old boy and you're just a good little gal, let me just give you scripture that says otherwise. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and this way death came to all people, Because all sinned. All of us are guilty. Romans 3.10 says there's none righteous, not one. Romans 3.23 says all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. All of us are sitting in the hot seat helplessly between a defender and a prosecutor. Our prosecutor. We know who our prosecutor is. By the way, did you know that the word Satan or Satan in Hebrew is not a fancy name? It is a literal word. It is one... Its definition is one who accuses in a court of law. Devil in Hebrew, devil, is simply someone who slanders someone else. I tell people all the time, if you're gossiping or slandering, you're demonic. (laughs) By definition of Hebrew words, it's demonic. But his name literally means one who prosecutes or accuses in a court of law. We see him in every court proceeding. I can see him and I can discern him in the lives of people who hold their heads down. I can discern him in in people who have been living for God their whole lives, who were baptized in his name, covered by the blood, filled with his spirit, and they still walk defeated. They're listening to the voice of an accuser, and they're tuned their ears out from the voice of a defender. Because when we really get a revelation that God is in a courtroom right now speaking on our our behalf we get a boldness about it's not by our own merit or virtue but we get a boldness because we know there is one who defends but our prosecutor according to Revelation 12 he says he accuses the brethren day and night he never stops in fact we see one of his oldest court proceedings it was the trial of the century he goes up into heaven and he walks up to God and he says there's a guy named Job down here And the only reason he's living for you is because nothing bad happens to him. 
The devil brought Job to trial and he was gathering evidence against him. And he was saying, the only reason he's living for you is because nothing bad happens. I've gathered the evidence. I've watched his life. I have collected data. The only reason he's doing anything good is because nothing bad happens to him. And God Almighty spoke and he said, I have more faith in him than he has in me. We forget about that sometimes, that God has faith in us. And God said, let's the court proceed and we will see who stands. God didn't have as much faith in Job's ability to stand as he did in his ability to quote law. And to defend the one who was on prosecution. God was able to defend him, but it starts off in heaven where the devil goes before God. And the Bible says, God looks at him and says, where have you come from? He says, I've come from going to and fro throughout the earth. He looks for people. He walks to and fro. In Isaiah it says that he walked in the fire of the Lord when he was an angel. But when he was cast down, he still walks. But this time, instead of looking behind the eyes of God of who to redeem, he walks by himself looking who he can exile. That's his entire purpose of being. He is the prince and power of this world, and he looks for people to accuse. And I can hear it in the voice of people who they've been listening to when they're accusing themselves of never being good enough. They're listening to the wrong voice. The devil still walks to and fro because we can see it in the New Testament. For 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, which that word in Greek is anti dikos it means one who accuses. Your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion. He walks about seeking whom he can devour. He walks through every church service. He sends his best through every home and he looks for people to accuse. He looks at you in your private life and he defeats you and says, you're never going to be good enough. You keep failing in private. Yeah, go worship God in public. Go, you hypocrite. That's what the devil says. And we begin reciting that to ourselves so that when we come into worship publicly, we can't even lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Because we're listening to the wrong voice. But I have good news. There's not just one attorney in this courtroom. For the opening scripture says we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Advocate is parakletos. We have a parakletos to his anti -dikos. A parakletos is one who defends in a court of law. And he forever defends. And he has never lost a case. We have more faith in Johnny Cochran's ability to get O.J. Simpson off of murder than we have God's ability to get us out of sin. How can we have more confidence in a good attorney than we do in our advocate? We, no matter what we've done, we should be able to come into a house of God and lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting because we have an assurance of who Christ is and what he did on our behalf. We should come in here with our heads held high and say, God, I have been made in your image. Your blood has covered me. Your blood has redeemed me. I am a new creature because of what you did on my behalf. This is outstanding news today because we can come in here and we can be like babes in Christ as new creatures not because of how much we do through our own endeavors of holiness through our own prayer life and our own fasting all that is is just trying to appease a God whom the blood has already appeased for God through the man Jesus was and will always be enough. There is nothing you can give to appease God. That's why we must have faith in the blood of Jesus. We have this advocate. And Jesus went on the trial that changed history. Brother Manny, he walked up to Pilate on trial. And the Bible says he opened not his mouth. Now, how can an individual as a defense attorney go into a courtroom, not say a word, and still win? How can he walk before this man and not defend himself, yet win the trial of the eons? You've got to understand Hebrew culture here for a moment. I'm a, I love to teach, so let me just help you here for a moment. Do you know in the Hebrew language there is a word that means exile? It is gola. And then there's the word for redeemed, which is guela. There's only one letter difference between the two. It's the letter aleph, which is our letter A in the English alphabet. The letter A in Hebrew is always silent. So when you put that silent letter into the middle of exile, it turns it into the word redeemed. So Jesus walked 
before his accuser silent because he was saying, I am the olive. And if you can take my silence and put it in your life, then you will go from exile to redeem. This is why he opened not his mouth. This is why he was led as a sheep to a shearer's dumb. This is why he didn't say a word. Because in Revelations, he said, I am the olive and the top. He said, I am the beginning and the ending. If you can take Jesus and put him in the middle of your exile, it immediately turns it into redeem. And we get aggravated when God's not saying anything to us in our season of doubt. We often say, God, why don't you just talk to me? Why don't you just help me? Why don't you give me a word? Why don't you let somebody discern what I'm going through? Give them a word of knowledge for me. How many's done this before? It's in the moment of silence that God doesn't have to speak because he's doing one thing. He's redeeming. When you're aggravated at God because he's not speaking, what he's doing is he's working on your behalf to take you out of exile into redemption. God did not speak during the exodus. He sent plagues, and the people were like, God, just give us a word. We've got all this stuff raining down on us. We've got frogs. We've got pestilence. Just say a word, and God didn't say anything because he was redeeming Israel. Don't get frustrated in God's silence. Rest assured, his silence means redemption. Amen? Amen? Let me, let me illustrate this for you. This is how the court system works. Brother, if you can come up here and help me. Pastor, if you can come help me. Brother, I'm going to use you too. If you can come on up here. Let's see. I'm going to use you. Can I use you? I won't embarrass you, I promise. I don't, I don't believe in embarrassing people at church. Amen. I believe God's a gentleman and I'm trying to be one too. So this is how this works. You're going to be, you're going to represent this entire room collectively. Can you do that? You're one individual. You just, tall order, but you can do it. I believe you can. So this is all of us. We're sitting on the hot seat right now. Then we have the judge who sits up here, and he stands up here, he's sitting on his heavenly throne. Pastor Manny, if you can just come up here, he's sitting on his heavenly throne. We have our accuser, I didn't pick you up because I think you're demonic, you've helped me a lot this afternoon by giving me a microphone and water, so I love you. But this is our, our accuser, okay? Now sis, if you can go up there, brother, if you can go up there. Now what happens is, we all sit from birth, born into sin, shaping in iniquity, born with a guilty conscience, all of us do. We all feel worthlessness. That's how we're born. And we sit here and we hear this voice constantly saying to us, we're born facing this direction. We face our accuser from the day we're born and we grow in flaws and in faults. And then gradually things just keep getting worse and worse and worse. And Because he's constantly saying, you're never going to be good enough. You're not smart enough. You don't have the right last name. You're not from the right family. You'll never be a preacher because you're not a part of this elite crew. You're never going to do this. You don't have the resources. I saw what you did in private. It's God will never promote you because he sees all things. You're never going to be smart enough. You're never going to get past that hidden sin that you deal with. Yeah, you hide it good at church, but I see it, and I know you see it too. So you're never going to really walk in authority. You're just going to be a faux copy of what you should be. You're going to be a shadow of your own reality. You're never going to come into the fullness. And this is what he says constantly. He's accusing. The devil has one thing that he uses. It's accusations. Amen? Loosely based off of reality. But the reality that he does not like to face is Isaiah 14 where it says in the end times when he is locked away during the millennial reign where the people are going to look at him and say, is this the man that caused all the problems to the nation? He is but trampled down. The devil hates that scripture because that's reality. So he accuses loosely based off of reality, constantly doing this. However, the judge in heaven thought himself not too highly to take off his priestly garments and to take off his, his judge robes. He decided, he said, I'm going to put on flesh and I'm going to enter the court system because, man, when a judge becomes a witness, <laughs> the whole courtroom changes. Because we know it's going to be one. If the judge has circumstantial enough evidence, then we know that he can get the person off. Of what he's being accused for. So the judge, God Almighty, says, I am going to come down into earth myself. And I am going to put on flesh. And I will make myself as the advocate. And what he does is he comes into this room. And he says, I'm going to be the defense attorney. So all he does is he says, I need you to turn. And stop listening to that voice. That is, by the way, repentance is not saying you're sorry. Its literal definition is to turn away from. So he says, I want you to turn away from the accusations you've been listening to. And I need you to listen to my voice for a season. I need you to listen to what I have to say about the matter. And Jesus Christ really only knows two words. 
in this courtroom. For every you're not good enough, there's a not guilty. For every not smart enough, there is a not guilty. For every you're not from the right family, not guilty. For every single mama from private sin, not guilty. You are never going to make it. Not guilty. You got yourself up when you fell into the same thing again. Not guilty. You try to go to church and do better, but you go back home and you're worse than you were before. Not guilty. You go home and you mess up just from the family, you're gonna you're gonna face generation curses. Not guilty. Father was a sinner. Not guilty. Mother not guilty. You're going to be a sinner. Not guilty. You're never going to be able to get that job because you can't get your life in order. Not guilty. This is all Jesus knows. <laughs> is this good news or not? Is this what we've been living our entire life for or not? This should give us a boldness in the spirit that we have an advocate who really only knows two words. He's not sitting over here beating us over the head. He's not over here saying dropping the gavel on top of us. He is constant. He is perpetual, never changing, forever merciful. And every single day that he finds a new accusation, there's new mercies he'll have. Because the Bible says he is rich in mercy. He is never going to run out of it. His bank account is full of it. He will always have enough energy to say not guilty he's never going to get wore out with saying it because we are in his image and in his passion this is the good news of the gospel but it requires somebody to turn away from this the law according to the bible says he can get us off of any offense whether your mind gets off of offense or not that's entirely up to you that's what I'm after tonight. I'm here after your soul. Your soul is telling you I'm never going to be good enough. You need to move forward into listening to this voice more often. I don't care what your family did. I don't care what you did yesterday. The moment you turn and you say, God, I want to listen to your voice. And you turn away from that voice. You start taking baby steps. You may still be flawed. Be better tomorrow. When tomorrow comes, do a little bit better the next day. Grow in grace. We're beating ourselves up because we haven't finished the whole race in a day. But I can't put down smoking. I can't stop drinking. Drink less tomorrow. Smoke less tomorrow. The next day, smoke a little less. Drink a little less. I'm just using the, the poster child sins. You can apply the rest. I'm depressed daily. Be depressed a little less tomorrow. Focus on the good things in life. And I know this is harder for some than others because of life situations. Stop looking at everybody else, though, and do a little bit better until eventually you're fully wrapped in the arms of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Sis, if you can come up and help me, too. If you read in the Bible, it says that if, now the Old Testament may be really hard to, to stay in, in turmoil and to, to, the death penalty was really hard to get because in order to uh, receive the death penalty in the Old Testament, they had to bring forth three witnesses. And they had to have just this raw material, they had to have raw evidence that the person committed the crime they said they did. And it wasn't until you could bring up three witnesses could they actually prosecute because God never wanted to just kill people. And I know this whole eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth mess. I know, it, context, context. God was with the law making it harder to kill people. He was using the law in its, in its moment. He was making it easier on women. And I know the Bible talks in the Old Testament about women not having rights and all that stuff. You should see what it was like before the law was given. The law was really benevolent. And then Jesus came and made the law even better. Amen. So we see that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let it so be established. That was a court context rule. That was a court procession. So this is what Jesus Christ does. He'll look at you and he'll say, okay, you're not convinced of what my blood did? Peter, come here. Because the Bible says we are compassed in, in, Rome, in Hebrews, we are compassed by so great a cloud of witnesses. The word witness is maturio, which literally means those who speak on behalf. Amen. You thought witnessing was just knocking on a door and inviting somebody to church. This is what a witness does. A witness comes in and Jesus says, Peter, speak to this man and remind this man what I can do. And Peter says, at the moment when this man needed me most, when he was hanging on the cross and I was his closest confidant, I walked away. I have a foul mouth and a hot head. I can't keep from getting into trouble because God made me zealous. And he wants to use my zealousness for his favor. But in the moment, my zealousness got a little out of control and I used it for my benefit. But when he came back, this man walked up and said, 
feed my sheep. He called me to preach the message that so many people are repeating in Acts. How could he do this unless he is really the God of gods and the King of kings he says he is? His blood must really be as amazing as we think it is because here I stand in heaven because of his blood. And if that's not enough to get you convinced, Paul, come here. I know you're a lady. I'm sorry. I just grabbed whoever's in front of me. Paul. Tell them what you used to do. And Paul sat there. And I can imagine in heaven he bows his head for a moment. And then he lifts it with holy assurance. And he says, there was a day when I killed every Christian I laid my eyes on. I was a murderer for the sake of religion. I was a Pharisee. And I heard what Jesus thought about Pharisees. Yet there was one day where he graciously knocked me off of my high horse. And he called me to preach this gospel. And because of him, I was anointed to write two-thirds of the New Testament. And if the blood can do it for me, I know he can do it for you. And I'm reminding you from heaven that God's blood... Blood is enough. Mary, come, let's finish off this court so we can get him free today. Mary comes up and Mary says, there was a moment where I was with every man in the town, yet this individual never laid an eye on me here on earth, but in heaven he had already seen me. And he walked up to me and just randomly drew a line in the sand and he looked at my accusers. And he said, ye without sin cast the first stone. And because of this man, here I stand in heaven today. And if his blood will do it for me, I'm reminding you, he'll do it for this person. He'll do it for you, he'll do it for you, he'll do it for you, he'll do it for you. This is what the blood does. This is what the blood has the power to do. Yet, there is one more piece of evidence in this courtroom that will seal the fate of all of us for redemption. Jesus coming down as the judge. The judge looks at the prosecutor and he says, I have evidence. That says he can be free today. And the devil begins to tremble because he knows he's already lost. The Lord looks at him and he says, I have blood that I found on the crime scene. You are going to be prosecuted for life. Eternity locked away. I got it reduced to three days. Only I can do that. And your fingerprints were all over the crime scene because you are with sin. You did do the crime. You should do the time. But what I went ahead and did is I spilled my blood over the whole crime scene. So everything he says is always going to be traced back to me, not you. Why do you think we baptize people? Because Paul said when you go underwater, it's covering of the blood. And when that blood covers you, it washes away every fingerprint of where you used to be, what you used to touch, what you used to say, how you used to act, what you used to look like. The blood washes away. So that when the devil comes with accusation, he says, I have good evidence. Then he looks at the blood and he says, what happened? I knew that your evidence was everywhere, but now all I see is his DNA on the crime scene. Jesus is the advocate for his people. Thank you. I'm coming to a close. We need to understand this blood thing. And we need to walk in it. I was talking to my wife last night and I told her, I said, we really don't have as much faith in the blood as we say we do. We're not as confident in Jesus as we say we are. Because if we were, we wouldn't be trying to fast to make him happy. Amen? Amen. If we really had faith in the blood, we would stop trying to pray 12 hours a day. And I'm not saying anything against that. I believe that's great. You pray to get Jesus, though. You don't pray to appease him. We're confusing what it takes to please him and what it takes to appease him. The only thing that can appease the wrath of God is the blood of Christ. You cannot fast enough, you cannot be holy enough to appease God. Because your righteousness is as filthy rags. What we do when we're holy, what we do when we pray, when we fast and we seek Him, we please Him. It's a marriage. It's like when your wife makes your favorite meal. She's not doing that to appease you. She's doing that to make her husband happy. This is how I'm loving on you. This is what I contribute to the relationship. This is how I'm going to love on you. That's what we do as the bride. I am not a preacher to appease God. I'm following my call to please Him. The only thing that can appease God on my behalf is His blood. We need to have real assurance in what the blood does. I am forever thankful that December 6, 1996, my father was preaching a message and conviction fell on me. And I went to an altar and I laid down. And I was just a young man. And the only thing I had on my mind, I didn't have all these crazy sins in my life. I wanted one thing in my life. I wanted a four-wheeler. That's all I wanted. I wanted a Honda Recon. That's all I wanted. I didn't even care if it was four-wheel drive. 
And I went to the altar as an innocent young man. I hit my knees, and I'll never forget that day. I hit my knees, and I said, Jesus, I don't have a testimony like my dad who was stuck in drugs and who lost his father and who was adopted by this other man. I don't have all those testimonies. But, God, I know there's one thing in this world I really want. I want a four-wheeler. But, God, I tell you what, I want you more than that. And it was through that innocence repentance of telling God he was the most important thing to me that the Holy Ghost fell on me December 6, 1996 and I began to speak in tongues and I saw that God truly loves everybody because it was just an innocent not eloquent prayer that God moved and then my dad explained to me he said son when you go into that water it's like the blood that's covering you and the Bible says that all things shall be made new old things will pass away He said, when you come out, you're going to be a new creature. And at that young age, I didn't know what that meant. But as I grew in grace and I began to walk and understand His Word, I have an assurance today that I can look to Him and say, God, I'm not perfect. But Your blood makes me eligible. And Lord, I'm putting all my faith and confidence in that blood. Because you see, there's always going to be two parts. God has done His part. Whether you walk in freedom, that's up to you. God has made you free the moment you have faith in it. The moment you you repent, you're baptized, you're filled with the Spirit, you're free. But you're going to have to set your own mind free. That's why the Bible says there is now therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. We need to let ourselves off the hook and say, Jesus, your blood is perfect. I'm not, but your blood is perfecting me. I'm not perfect yet, but Lord, I know that you are helping me. You're moving me forward in grace. Watch this, Isaiah 43. Watch what this says. Isaiah 43, 25, it says, I, this is God speaking, even I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. And I remember your sins no more. But look what he turns to us and he commissions us. He says, now I want you to participate in this. Join with me. Review your past for me. That takes us. We need to take a catalog and we need to go through everything we've done. That doesn't create condemnation. It creates humility. I'm not perfect, but the blood is. Review the past for me. Now, let us argue the matter together. State the case for your innocence. So do you know what I do? When I have a moment, when I fall below what I know I'm supposed to be, I say, God... I admit it, this is what I did, and I will name it. See, what we do, it's like cat litter in the middle of our living room. We're sweeping around and we're cleaning everything, but we're leaving the mess right in the middle of the living room. And we can smell it, it's there, but we're not addressing it. Sweeping the corners. And we don't ever go into prayer and we say, Lord, forgive me for lying. Forgive me for gossiping about Sally. Because we're embarrassed by it. We just say, Lord, forgive me for my sins. And the Lord is saying, no. Review your past for me, state your case, and let us argue the matter together. There is nothing more liberating than looking at the devil and saying, everything you're saying is true. I am worthless. There's nothing good about me. However, I'm about to remind you of your reality and mine. And you turn and you say, Jesus, there is truly nothing good about me. My righteousness is filthy rags. But your blood covers all of that. And you remember, the Bible says, my sins no more. So what you do when you're constantly living in defeat, the, devil, the Lord's looking at you and He's saying, what are you talking about? I have forgotten that. You see, He has all power to forget. We just harp and hammer on His all-knowing side, but He's all-powerful too. That means He has the power to stop knowing. That's what His blood does. Revelations 12, 10 says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. This is His current reality. This isn't future tense. This is what's already done. Your adversary has been beaten. They triumphed over Him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Admit it, you deserve life without parole. But Jesus got it reduced to three days, and we can walk in newness of life now. 
I want us to stand and I want to give you one more bit of evidence to set you free today. First John 1 says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Faithful. That doesn't change. That doesn't change through your insecurities. That doesn't change through your ups and downs. He is faithful. He is just to forgive us our sins. But look at Zechariah 3 verse 1 for me. I know I'm jumping around my scripture, but if you can pull up that very last scripture. Zechariah 3 verse 1, it says, Then he showed me Joshua. This is in heaven, mind you. And it's taking place contextually as a courtroom where he's standing before 24 elders and he's standing before the judge. A man named Joshua, the high priest, stood before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. This is a court. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebukes you. O Satan, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. See, the church joined in with the rebuking of God. We need to be saying the same thing God is saying for sinners. He involved Jerusalem, the church. He said, church, come here, join with me in witnessing to this individual. Rebuke Satan. Is this not a brand that was plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. You know what he was saying in the most literal sense there? This is from A.J.'s literal translation of the Bible. He looked at Joshua and he said, That orange jumpsuit of the world doesn't look good on you. The black and white stripes doesn't suit you that ball and chain that's around your ankle I never made you that way I never created hell for you why do you think it has to enlarge itself daily because people are choosing to go to a place I never designed big enough for anyone to go it was made big enough for one person that cell was only made for one individual Satan he already dwells there and he don't like to be alone so he's convincing you that you belong there with him but I never designed hell for anybody So what I'm going to do is if you will confess with me and you will allow me, I will take off the orange jumpsuit of the world, your own iniquities. And I'm going to clothe you with my own righteousness. This is the good news. And here's the thing. Acts said it was available to everyone. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. I don't care. If you have been in church for 20 years, I know what I feel in this room. You're battling your mind right now. You're not moving forward in the ministry God has called you to because you don't feel good enough. You're battling what's happening in your family right now. Things you have not spoken to your leadership and your pastors. I know what I'm feeling in the Holy Ghost right now. There are people in this room who have been fighting your own family. And you have taken a sabbatical because you don't feel good enough. It's not a sabbatical of rest. It's a sabbatical you're taking because you don't feel like you're worthy. I'm all for sabbaticals of rest, but this is not a sabbatical of rest and I'm feeling some of you are taking. You're taking it because you don't feel like you're good enough. The Lord has established His blood on your life, has made you eligible for whatever He has called you to do. There are some in this room who have never been baptized in the name of Jesus. Today is an amazing day to be baptized in His name and to have everything washed away. So with every head bowed, in fact, before you bow your heads, this is what I want to do. I want us to all come to the altar right now. We cannot effectively move into 2020. We will. We'll move into it because time just marches on unapologetically. Doesn't care about your past. Time doesn't care about the loss in your life. One of the hardest things my wife and I had to endure is when our son passed away. I could not go on social media for months because I saw people just moving on. And it was hard. It was nearly impossible. I couldn't, couldn't even stand to see people moving on because our world stopped October 26. And the hardest thing we ever had to do was take a step back out and start moving forward. That was with time, mind you. I'm not, I'm not even going to be up here trying to tell you that we did it immediately. Over time, we started to move forward and we eased out into time and we started launching back out. And that was frightening. It was intimidating. And it still felt wrong. But we knew time was not stopping for us. I'll just be transparent with you. 
as a preacher of the gospel, raised in a godly home, had every opportunity to live right, thoughts of suicide entered this mind. Thoughts of worthlessness as a father and a husband entered this mind. But there was a moment, I'll never forget it, I was in a house that wasn't my own, and I was sitting in my bedroom, and I sat on a couch, and I said, God, I'm worthless. I couldn't even rescue my own son. What kind of father am I? And the Lord spoke to me, and He said, you're in the image of me, you're a father like I am. And the Lord spoke to me, He said, stand up. So in that time, I stood up, and my head was hanging. It was months before I could lift my head up. But the Lord started showing me the power of His blood. The blood has restored a damaged soul. And I stand before you today healing because of the blood of Jesus. So I have joined with a multitude of witnesses. And I will stand in heaven. And I will look before my brothers. When the Lord calls me and He says, Aaron, enter thou in into my to heaven my good and faithful servant I will stand there and I will peer through and I will be speaking on his behalf and I will say he deserves to be here as well because if the blood brought me it should bring him and I'm going to look and say he deserves to be in heaven too and I'm going to be hollering over God's shoulder let them come in too because your blood was enough let them come as well because your blood covered me and you are no respecter of persons so if the blood will cover me how much more will it cover you So this is what we're going to do collectively. I want you to raise your hands. I want you to close your eyes. 